Hey, what's up guys, it's the Wild Burrito with a game review, but not a regular one. It's on one of my favorite games of all time, the game that I cannot shut up about, Crane in the Sky, first chapter. I will try my best to not fab too hard while I talk about this game and stay unbiased in front of some potential issue the game might have, but I cannot guarantee shit. I cannot also guarantee that all the footage you will see are from the first game. I might use some footage from Trail in the Sky, the third, just because I just finished it. I still didn't get over some emotion that game made me feel. Huh. <sighs> yeah. That fucking game. That being said, during the Sky first chapter follow the story of Estelle and her adopted brother Joshua. Five years prior to the story, Joshua tried to kill Estelle's father Cassius but got completely annihilated by him. Cassius brought Joshua back to his home and offered him to let the life of assassin behind him and stay with his family. Back to present day, Joshua and Estelle are becoming junior bracer. The Bracer Guild is an organization spread on all the continent that has for own goal to protect and serve the citizen by taking Taking the requests ranging from monster elimination to escort mission or even cat retrieving all without interfering in politics between country. To be promoted to senior bracer, Joshua and SL will have to travel the country to gain experience as bracer. The road ahead won't be easy between having to confront the army, recovering mystery artifacts and the sudden disappearance of their father. They will have to surpass themselves and join force with new ally aka other playable character and that's the best I can do without spoiling the story. The story is the second best thing in the game just after every single bitch lap. No, but seriously, the story and the lore slash universe are intriguing, fascinating and just amazing. I think one of the strongest reason why is that the writer really know how to write character that feel human. Every character you will encounter will have different personality and motivation and that's gonna affect how much they will try to help you or how much they will try to be a pain in your ass. Like Oliver, the wandering bard who's on a journey to find all the beauty the world has to offer just to appreciate it. He start following your group because of how beautiful Sherazad and Joshua are. You can also break a fight between people with a song just cause everybody gets weirded out by his performance. Also characters are not just responsive to each other action, they will also react to a person rank or pass or where they come from. If you are in one of the character native city, you will get longer dialogue from NPC asking news from him or her and giving you information about that person backstory. On the same set of idea, Joshua and Estelle sometimes tell to people that their father is Cassius Bright, which make people lose their shit because he's known as the Divine Blade, a legendary war hero and a fucking god among men. He's a fucking ridiculous. All the reasons that I just listed are the reason why the world feels so interconnected and alive. While I already talked a lot about the character and the world, I didn't talk about the story in itself. The story goes a little bit everywhere with different storylines one after another or even two at the same time. But it's not pure chaos or messy, it's more to show all the singularity of this world and setting up stuff for future game, which I'm fine with, but I can get why would people be annoyed by a game that really felt like just a setup or other game. While I could ramble and continue on the plot for hours, I wanna attack the gameplay now. While the gameplay almost feels secondary in this game, it is as good as everything else in this game. At first, building up a character seems quite Quite simple, you open some Orbman slot to put quartz that will give you various stats and spell but every quartz got different element value and it's not as easy as putting a lot of wind quartz on a character to get a good wind mage because some wind quartz decrease magic attack. And some win attack need other element like this one that needs space and win to be earned. Also opening slot and buying quartz cause Sifit that you could also convert into Mira which is the currency in this game. So you will have to be careful when you invest your resource into your equipment and or your 
rewards for every character if you don't want to waste too much time farming Sifit and or Mira. Obviously, every character have unique ability, stat, and armament slot. Funny thing, it's not because a character is built as a fighter or a mage that you will always want him to do the same thing. See the sidebar on the left of the screen? It shows who's gonna play next and if they will get a buff on that turn. How often they appear is completely RNG. It can range between a 100% crit chance, recovering HP, or any of these, meaning that you will have to plan every move you make to optimize your damage. Where you end up on the sidebar depend on the character speed and the attack you chose. Also, if you have enough points, you can build with the character at any moment to break the rhythm of the combat and take advantage of a crit or any other buff to use that ultimate move you need combat point that you will gain by being attacked or attacking an enemy. However, sometimes it's more useful to spend those points on combat action to vary in cost and effect for every team member. Overall, the gameplay is really easy easy to pick up and yet complex to master. Even though what I've talked so far is really important, I have so much to still go through. Ah, fuck me. Okay, let's try to be quick, I guess. The thing that annoyed me the most in my first playthrough was that sometime I was investing a lot of time to get good quartz and equipment for a character just to see that character leave my group for story reason. I cannot imagine how a pain in my ass that could be in the highest level of difficulty when you really need every edge possible. Also the game is really fun on your first playthrough but on the second one it become a little bit irritating to have to skip all the dialogue and like I said earlier the game hype you a lot for the future of the series so you kinda just wanna go on on the next game. In the defense of the game it still take a good 40 hours to beat the game so the durability is not that bad. Another thing before I leave the developer kinda abuse on missable item and item stuff in general so I recommend playing with the guide if you don't want to miss too much and I can see why people would be unpleased to have to play with the guide. Anyway I could go on for hours but I fucking won't. Overall the game is fantastic fantastic but it's not made for everyone. If you don't want to start an RPG with a really heavy story, might not take this one first. But if you want to discover something new and let yourself be moved by the story, go on, go ahead, it's amazing. One last thing, this was only my review of the first game. There was a couple of games in that series, so uh, good luck! Anyway, if you liked the video, please give it a thumbs up if you like my sexy voice. Think about subscribing to my channel and becoming part of the One Nation. On this note, see ya.